Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the April 2nd uh, board and co board conference and business meeting of the school district of Haverford Township. Uh, if I could ask folks uh, to rise if you'd like to, and let's uh, go through the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, with and liberty invisible. and justice for all. Thank you. Mr. Regal, would you mind calling the roll, please? Yes. Um, Dr. Crispin? Here. Mr. Fleischer? I'm here. Ms. Larson? Here. Ms. Minji? Here. Mr. Sinto? Here. Mr. Schwartz? Here. Ms. Snodgrass? Here. Ms. Wiedemann? Here. Mr. Feinberg. Here, thank you very much. Uh, before we get started, uh, I have a statement I'd like to read and some comments. Um, this is a meeting of the Board of the School District of Haverford Township. No members of the public will be admitted to the Oakmont location this evening due to Governor Wolf's recent directives. For your safety and convenience, the meeting will instead be live streamed and members of the public are invited to attend the meeting virtually and participate in public comment sections of the meeting via Zoom. The meeting agenda can be reviewed on the district's website. Directions are available on the district website regarding the procedures for public comment through email. Such comment will be read publicly at the appropriate time during the meeting. Please note that your name and address is required in order for your comment to be read publicly during the meeting. Thank you for your cooperation during this time. And please be aware that this meeting is being recorded and will be available on the district website. Welcome to uh, what appears to be a brave new world. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like to thank and acknowledge some folks. Um, first of all, uh, all of our staff who were involved and are still involved in making sure that uh, all of our students uh, are receiving uh, meals uh, and technology. Uh, I know that uh, was an effort to coordinate and we very much appreciate uh, the food service folks, bus drivers, uh, volunteers. Um, also would like to uh, certainly acknowledge all of the medical personnel that live in our township. They're, they are on the front lines for us. Um, and uh, can't stress enough uh, how much we appreciate that. And I would strongly urge all of our residents to help them in the best way that we can, which is to stay home. Um, and the second way that you could say that you could help them is to stay home. So please uh, follow the guidelines from the governor and, and do that. Um, uh, I'd also like to just acknowledge uh, Dr. Rushi, who uh, normally only works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but uh, for the past few weeks, uh, somehow she seems to have found time uh, to, to put more time in. Um, this is a tough situation uh, for everyone and uh, we appreciate uh, her steady hand uh, on the tiller uh, guiding the district. Um, I, I wanna let the public know that uh, you know, we, we are in touch with uh, the state, statewide educational organizations on a regular basis. We're in touch with the Delaware County Intermediate Unit. Uh, there are meetings several times a week of all the superintendents in the county. Uh, there are meetings with uh, PSBA folks statewide. Um, everyone is going through a learning curve uh, and we're sharing best practices together. I would ask that uh, the public and our parents and students uh, 
be as patient as, as you can summon uh, under the circumstances. Um, this is not uh, a situation that is going to go away in a short period of time. Um, and we appreciate uh, your patience and understanding. Um, we're a fortunate district. We're a relatively wealthy district. Um, and we're able to confront this situation uh, with a little more ammunition than some of our neighbors and some of our, the other districts around the state. Um, moving everything online um, has some real challenges, uh, especially if you look at uh, situations like career and technical schools. Um, it's hard to learn welding <laughs> uh, on, on the internet. Uh, so career and tech is one area. Certainly uh, higher poverty districts where folks don't have the technology uh, is a burden. Uh, we know that there are challenges with special ed and providing special ed services. We know there are challenges with uh, ESL uh, and, and with gifted students. Uh, and we know that there are real challenges in the rural districts of our state. Uh, there was an article today where uh, parents are driving their children to the Dairy Queen because there's a Wi-Fi hotspot there so they can download their homework and then come back the next day to upload their homework. So uh, uh, please uh, be patient with us. We're learning. Uh, we're all learning this together. Uh, we appreciate uh, the uh, participation. I, I see right now we have about 57 people attending the meeting and uh, we thank you for that. And uh, at this point, uh, I would ask the board, Dr. Rushi, would you like, like me to uh, have you speak now or shall I run through the, the minutes and uh, public comment? I'm okay waiting if you do want to do the minutes and, and public comment and then I, I will make my superintendent remarks. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll accept the motion to approve the official minutes from the March 5th, 2020 regular public board meeting. This is Bridget Wiedemann, moved. Mr. Sinto, second. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 If I could Aye. interrupt for one moment just to clarify for our board members, Mr. Feinberg, uh, because this is online, uh, when you indicate I, if you would kindly state your name um, so that we know who, who that is for our recording purposes in the, in the actual minutes. We were given an order to follow. Should we be following that as well? Yes, please. Thank you. That would help tremendously. All right, then I will start. Uh, Dr. Crispin, yes. Ari Fleischer, yes. Kristen Larson, yes. Susan. Can you hear me now? Yep. It's yeah. saying I can't get on the video because someone won't let me. I don't know. The host has stopped my video, but I say I. We can continue with that. Mr. Sinto, yes. Dave Schwartz, yes. Antoinette Snodgrass, yes. Bridget Wiedemann, yes. Am I last? Yes. I have, I have nine voting yes. Thank you. Thank you for that. In terms of public comment, this is also going to be a uh, learning exercise. Um, it's my understanding uh, that uh, we had received uh, two uh, two emails uh, during the day today. Uh, Ms. Deacon, would, could you update me on those and uh, would you be able to read those for us? Yes, we, we did have two emails, so I can read them now. The first email is from Mike. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Okay. yes. From Mike and Lori Dershowitz at 1 Brennan Drive. To the school board members of Haverford Township, every parent in the township realizes these are unprecedented times. 
We understand that the PDE in Haverford Township had no contingency plans to continue learning at a time like this, and we appreciate the township's efforts to react. I'd like to offer two suggestions and add our names to those other parents who may also be asking for the same. One, continuous learning through spring break. Due to the necessary slow start to distance learning, as parents, we are gravely concerned about how this transition is impacting our child's education and future. We strongly recommend that distance learning be continued through spring break next week with regular daily curriculum. Routine is important to humans during quarantine and in life. As parents, we are juggling our jobs and are now forced to be our kids' classroom monitors as well. Leaving parents without a plan during the week of spring break will cause significant disruption to routines already established. This is especially acute in elementary schools. Please do not delay in this decision. Two, schools must move, excuse me, schools must move to live meeting, I'm, so, I'm sorry, it's up to my throat. Schools must move to live meetings with students. Distance learning plans are varied depending on age and school. We have three children. Our other two children attend different schools and since last week were on regular meetings with their teachers. While the middle and high schools are using Google Classroom for real-time chat, this is harder in elementary schools because kids are developing and reading and typing skills. We strongly encourage the township to figure out class meetings and quickly more than just YouTube videos for students to interact with their teacher again. We realize that 24 kids on a class meeting may not be feasible. 12 kids once a day on one subject or another is feasible. And even though time with the teacher would be much shorter, it would add something whereas right now we have nothing and the kids miss their teachers and peers. Furthermore, we encourage the township to assume the worst and that Governor Wolf will move the state to distance learning for the remainder of the school year. While that is certainly not ideal, it is likely, and wait and see attitude is not optimal for our children's progress. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our second um, letter is from Tom Hastings at 1343 Harrington Road, Havertown, PA. I would like to thank all the teachers and staff of the Haverford School District who have done a Herculean job of dealing with the extreme challenges that the current situation is presenting. In particular, I would like to recognize everyone at Linwood where my two daughters are in kindergarten and second grade for setting up a flexible learning program quickly and being so available for questions and feedback. My questions are related to the potential for adding days and or time to next year's school calendar to make up for lost classroom days this year. While we are all doing our best to continue teaching our children under these new conditions, it seems apparent that these efforts cannot replicate the in-class instruction that the great teachers at Linwood and the entire school district, from what I hear from other parents, provide to our children each and every day, even in the best of circumstances. A highly motivated older student, one or both parents available to assist, good technology access at the home. But for many parents with young children right now who may be both working full-time from home or dealing with extreme financial pressures or still working outside the home, perhaps in stressful healthcare occupations or taking care of others, grandparents or younger children in the house, none of the above conditions may be present. So while we are all in this together, even within the Linwood community, much less the Haverford School District and the state nation as a whole, there exists a gap between those who can deal with the new learning environment and those with much more limited capacity to oversee their children's education. To me, this means that the huge disparities in resources that already negatively impact education in this country will only be exasper exasperated in this crisis, and we could see significant and long-lasting differences between those who maintain their current progress levels and those who fall even further behind. If and when the rest of the school year is canceled, we are looking at almost six months out of the classroom. If the 2021 start date remains the same, while I am not an education expert, everything I have read appears to indicate that such a long amount of time away from daily instruction would have a lasting impact on many students as encapsulated in this article from the Washington Post. And he references. With the rec full recognition that there is no one 
that no one is sure when this period will be over and when schools and businesses could even open again, I would like to know if anyone at the school district is thinking of potential options for increasing the amount of instructional time our children would receive next year or this year, depending on the calendar, to make up for some of this lost time. I read with interest that um, Secretary Riviera was, was so firm in his statement that the school year cannot continue beyond June 30th. And then he references a uh, Penn Live news article, a link. He mentioned that by statute, we cannot extend school past June 30th. But as we just saw with the emergency legislation re referred to in that article, which Dr. Rushi asked parents to support in her 320 email, and of course, in many other areas of life right now, everything appears to be on the table and open for debate right now. If these truly are unprecedented times, and I think we can all agree that they are, then I think all school year calendar schedule options should be considered. For example, a shorter summer session, moving up next year to begin on August 1st or even July 1st, extending next year to July 1st, adding 15, 20, 30, 45 minutes to each school day next year. Obviously, all of these things would require more funding, but as as we're also seeing emergency legislation and directing money to those people and industries that are being hit hard right now. And I would hope that ensuring the equitable and effective education of our children is something that the general public and its legislators could rally behind. I think it would be helpful as well for the district to clarify which decisions are being made by which entity. How much authority does the Haverford School Board have over some of these decisions? via the, the county, the State Department of Education, the governor's office, and federal rules and regulations. I apologize for the length of this question, but there's so much going on right now. Perhaps a school board could have a virtual town hall or something similar in the very near future. Dr. Rushi's emails have been regular and super informative, but there is little sense of what is happening behind the scenes and what decisions are being made by whom. Sincerely, Tom Hastings, Thomas Hastings. Thanks to uh, both of the parties that submitted questions. Anna, have you received any additional comments uh, since the meeting began? Uh, no, we haven't received any emails since it started. If any do come through, I will, um, I will let you know. Okay, and I'll just let the public know that any comments received uh, after the end of this public session uh, will certainly be shared with the board. For this evening's meeting, uh, we do not have uh, student reports from the middle school and the high school. Hopefully, uh, next time out, uh, we'll, we'll bring the students back in. And that leads us to Dr. Rushi. Thank you, Mr. Feinberg. Okay. Uh, I'd like to start with a, with a few remarks. And then I'm going to ask you to allow me to give some time to some of my administrative colleagues this evening to share a little bit of the specifics that have been going on in terms of the planning and uh, what has been happening in a number of departments. On March 13th, our landscape certainly changed as we know it, and it seems like the change was overnight. We are migrating from an environment in which everyone felt a certain degree of confidence, security, and safety to one that is filled with tremendous uncertainty. Yet, through it all, one thing has become extremely evident to me. Our staff continue to put children first when making any decisions. We have a fantastic team in our district, as many people know, and a fabulous support system across the community that is our township. The emails of appreciation and support for our work continue to arrive on a daily basis. They provide a source of inspiration to all. Please don't underestimate any email that you send to us. The questions and the requests for more information are always preceded by a sincere thank you for everything that we are doing. Our building principals, our central office staff, and all administrators across the district are planning, collaborating, sharing work, and just pitching in for, for one another, all in service to our students. The sharing of ideas, the brainstorming that takes place, not just within our district, but across our county uh, is inspiring as well. If there is anything good to come out of this experience, and I genuinely believe 
that there will be something good to come out of it. One thing is the recognition of how our community within our township and throughout our, our, the five county area pull together to support one another in schools. And for that, we are, we are grateful. There is one very important thing that I, I want us to focus upon as a community and be very mindful of moving forward. And that is the need for social distancing. While it is extremely important for both our physical and mental health to get outdoors and to be able to take in the fresh air, the sunshine, uh, and just step away from computers and everything in, in our homes for our health sake, um, social distancing must be practiced in order to keep all of us safe. So we're, our messages are all going to start reminding people of the importance of that until that occurs uh, on a much broader level. Um, that's what is going to prevent us from being able to get back in, into our schools. With respect to the two comments that, that came in this evening, there are a, a couple of very brief remarks that I can make in response to that. And one is that we have planned for three of the five days during spring break next week um, will be days of learning. We are not planning for the entire week because we want to be sensitive to the holidays that families will be observing and recognizing. So three of the, of the days, uh, and that, inf that information um, is communicated to two families. I understand there's been a lot of communication out to families, so I'm happy to have the opportunity to, to say that once again and to put that out there. We are also looking at the safest way possible that we can provide opportunities for live interaction with teachers, particularly knowing the, the extension now of time that children will not be with us um, in our schools. And in regards to the second question or comments that came in, um, yes, the commenter was correct in that there are a number of statutes. There are also collective bargaining agreements that are in place uh, that we must be mindful of. That does not mean these are barriers. Uh, it just means these are things that need to, you know, we do need to take a look at. You know, ensuring an equitable and effective education is key to our work. Uh, and certainly what drives the decisions that, that we are making as an entity when we move forward. Uh, that's enough from me right, for right now. I've had lots of opportunity to send messages out and communicate with the public. At this time, I'd like to toss it over to my colleague, Jen Saxa, who will talk with us a little bit about what her team and the curriculum office have been, have been doing to make all of this possible uh, since we met with teachers on March 13th. Thank you very much, Dr. Rushi. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, adding my gratitude as well to the educators, to the students and families, to our coordinators, principals, assistant principals, math coaches, lead teachers, and all of our staff who have uh, engaged now in several different phases of planning and implementation of our flexible learning plan. Uh, this evening, I'll provide you a, a little bit of a timeline as sort of an overview of the activities in which we have engaged and the work that has been done thus far in, uh, in order to meet the requirements that have been set forth by the Pennsylvania Department of Education regarding the continuing education of students during this extended closure. Um, so we'll go all the way back, which feels like a really long time ago, but probably wasn't, to March 9th. Uh, on March 9th, our, our curriculum department drafted an academic plan for at the time what was a potential long-term closure. Uh, this plan included a definition of the term flexible learning for this purpose, uh, a timeline for planning, testing, and implementing the first phase of flexible learning, as well as guidelines for lessons, for teacher availability, and for the use of technology as a means of communication. Uh, the next day, March 10th, we informed our community that we would be uh, closing our schools for professional development on Friday the 13th, which I believe was also a full moon, uh, in order to prepare for a potential school closure. So uh, then on March 11th, which was the next day, uh, we actually met as a curriculum department and set of principals with around 70 educators in two separate meetings, a secondary meeting and an elementary meeting, to review the draft plan that uh, we had come up with and get some input from the actual teachers who would be working with students in implementing this plan. Uh, we got mainly uh, questions of clarification and ideas about how to share the plan and how to implement it uh, with the rest of the staff. 
Uh, so on March 13th, the day of the professional development, we uh, all of our educators, this includes our counselors, our psychologists, as well as our teachers at every level, uh, met in small groups. Uh, I believe that all those groups were fewer than 10. And uh, they worked to, uh, or they, some of them met virtually, and everyone viewed some introductory videos, one from Dr. Rushi, one from me, and one from our Director of Pupil Services, uh, Nicole Battistelli. They then spent their time collaborating so that they could determine which topics would be the most important to be addressed in the light of a, an extended school closure. They also had to learn about some new technologies and how to use those technologies and how to create and in some cases or update their websites. About an hour after our work concluded that very same day, Governor Wolf did announce a two week closure. And it was determined at that time that those two weeks were, were to be a time for review and maintenance of skills rather than new learning. So that was a Friday. Our teachers took the next two days to then take the plans that they had spent the day creating and adjust them to make sure that they were not asking students to move forward and rather they were focusing on reviewing and maintaining skills. Um, they also needed to change some of the activity requirements because this announcement was made on a day that our students were not in school and were unable to take home their books, their supplies, uh, and so we wanted to make sure that we had activities that could actually be accomplished and engaged in without those items. Uh, so then March 19th to the 25th, our coordinators, teachers, and administrators have been working hard uh, to support students as fa and families as they actually engaged with those activities, which we had planned, and then also started planning what any additional closure time may look like. Uh, on March 23rd, in fact, uh, Governor Wilk did announce an extended closure for uh, two more weeks. And at this point, the curriculum department drafted a document with input from the technology department, pupil services, principals, and educators. Uh, it was updated and had much more information in it. Uh, the goal of this 18-page document was to present a clear set of guidelines uh, for educators regarding expectations, time allotments, support systems, as well as technology. On March 24th, we this time held a virtual meeting with the same 70 teachers to again, ask for input and feedback. Uh, we did make some adjustments and uh, then we created another overview video for our staff to watch so they could get a sense of what would be required in this next phase, which included new learning. Uh, on March 25th, 110 people attended a virtual drop-in meeting uh, to hear more about the plan, ask any questions, or just share some thoughts or ideas about how to implement. Simultaneously, on this very same day, a comprehensive flexible learning guide for families was drafted, and that included, as you saw, I'm sure, uh, program overviews, technology platforms and contacts, time guidelines, roles, and supports. Uh, this is posted on the website now, and we will continue to update it as necessary. Uh, we, we do, I want to mention, appreciate, as Mr. Feinberg mentioned, the countywide collaboration that has been continuous throughout this. It has enabled us to work together, share ideas, develop guides and programs. Uh, we've been sharing resources and ideas and, and meet at least twice a week since this has been happening. Uh, on March 26th and 27th, each and every educator met to collaborate with colleagues virtually and developed a five to eight day plan that would provide each student with new learning according to those guidelines that we had set forth. Uh, we did make sure to remind each other that we needed to remain flexible. We need to provide activities that do not require the use of a device the entire time and that provide equitable learning activities for those without internet access. On March 30th, after only a very short time uh, that they had to learn new technology to collaborate or to develop a plan, our educators posted a week's worth of learning assignments and activities for all students first thing that Monday morning, which believe it or not was only four days ago. Uh, they continue this week to join curriculum, building, grade level, department, and team meetings to collaborate and have already started to make adjustments based on the feedback that they're getting from their students and from the families of those students. Just to get a sense of it, a typical day for a teacher will include posting assignments, meeting as a faculty to share uh, feedback that they're hearing as a building, being available for student and family questions, making follow-up and outreach phone calls, 
providing clarifications, communicating with students, both in a way that is responsive as well as a way that is proactive. It also includes time to collaborate with grade level and department colleagues to adjust and refine what they've presented for the week. Uh, time has also been set aside specifically to support students who have IEPs, 504 um, and EL needs, as well as gifted needs. There's also time set aside for attendance at IEP meetings, which will still continue to happen. Of course, there needs to be time for planning, uh, recording lessons, designing learning assignments, et cetera, and then additional time at the end of each day in order to be available again to students and families. I would like to acknowledge that um, just as our families out there in the community have had to adjust to balancing work demands while caring for children or perhaps others in their homes, our educators have been doing the same. Um, much of the work that you've heard me describe here today was done with one child on a lap and a second child yelling questions from the other room. Uh, so we can certainly sympathize with the experiences that our families in the community are having. And, and I, with a heartfelt promise, we promise to continue to work to find the right balance of providing meaningful educational experience for our children, while at the same time being mindful of the home environment. Um, as always, we value feedback and input from you and from our community of learners and students and families will be asked by their teachers, some have already, uh, some will be, to share about their experiences thus far in, for, in order to, to inform the rest of what we're doing here. Um, there has been some conversation recently about exactly what to call this type of education. Is it remote learning? Is it online instruction? Uh, maybe more accurately, I've heard it described as crisis schooling. Uh, we're doing our best and, and we're, we're working really hard to stay connected to students and to families. Uh, we're trying to provide some meaningful engagement and learning activities and, and really trying to support our community. Change has been occurring at a fairly quick pace and, and I would like to personally thank uh, not only the students and families for the way that they have been working to adjust to our new normal, but also to our incredible fac faculty for all that they have done to shift and to adapt. Uh, we look forward to evolving through this process and moving forward with the whole child as our focus. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Nicole Battistelli, who will describe the ways Pupil Services has been supporting students and families. Thank you, Jen. Um, so over the last few weeks, the Pupil Services Department has worked in conjunction with the Delaware County Intermediate Unit and other school districts from Delaware and Chester County to establish a plan for offering educational opportunities to all students. Many districts are working together and this is obviously a new experience for all of us. This situation is quickly evolving and plans seem to change just as quickly as they are made. We have worked closely with our technology department to bring on new software such as Zoom and DocuSign, which are necessary for us to have have in order to move forward with holding IEP meetings and offering related services. We're thankful to our tech department for all their support and guidance through this process. Teachers have participated in many, many virtual meetings to elicit feedback and provide guidance as we all navigate this new learning together. We have recently had a drop-in session of just pupil services personnel with about 100 people in it, um, all asking questions and all working together. Um, we're thankful, I'm sorry, I'm about my spot. <laughs> um, our teachers are also participating in a variety of training modules right now so that they can um, best utilize the technology that's now available. Our teachers of students who receive special education support and services have worked diligently with their general education peers to provide the necessary modifications and accommodations for their students. In addition, they've been in contact with the parents of students they service, offering learning opportunities and office hours. Flexible learning plans have been developed based on the needs of their students, and they are moving forward with plans to hold IEP meetings remotely. Our teachers of English learners have worked closely with families to ensure they have access to the same information as other, other families in the district. Teachers have been in constant contact with the families of English learners utilizing um, the communication app Talking Points, which our families have been using over the past couple of years. Um, teachers have worked with the general education teachers to modify curriculum as they would just as though school were in session. And in addition, they're working to support their students through a variety of tools, including the use of the online version of their curriculum. Our guidance counselors have ensured that all general education teachers have digital copies of 504s for ease of planning so that teachers are planning lessons with the needs of their students with 504s in mind. 
Our teachers of students who receive gifted services have worked to support the general education teachers in their planning. They've also updated their websites with flexible learning plans to challenge their students. Our related services personnel have worked diligently to adjust their practices and plan for teletherapy. This has required a lot of new learning and coordination so that we may move forward with offering therapies remotely. We plan to continue to monitor the needs of our students and make adjustments as necessary while still accommodating the needs of our family during this time. On another, another note, today is World Autism Awareness Day as identified by the United Nations to spread awareness and acceptance of people with autism. Now my colleague, Sarah Christensen, will talk about her department and how they've um, made all of this possible for our children. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Good evening, everyone. I wanted to start by saying the robust by saying that the robust list of accomplishments that have occurred over the past few weeks would not have been possible without the time, effort, and incredible dedication from all members of the technology department. From the very beginning, <clears throat> this team began to utilize a cell phone application called GroupMe to collaborate and provide support virtually in real time without skipping a beat. It was a priority to provide access to devices at home in order for students to engage with any potential learning platform that might be utilized. Our one-to-one -one initiative at the high school provided devices for our students in grades nine through 12 already. This allowed us to focus on the needs of our kindergarten through eighth grade students. So how did we ensure that our students did actually have access? You may recall that there were two technology surveys that were created and administered via a phone call to determine the need of equipment and home internet access across the entire district. This provided us target information on number of devices to prepare for distribution. The number of distributions we had um, were a couple and in a couple of different formats. Our first distribution occurred on March 17th, where 350 Chromebooks were prepared and distributed across all six of our elementary schools and middle school. Um, in grades K to eight, it was target for all students K to eight. Our second distribution occurred on March 24th. This was a minimal contact drive through by scheduled appointment and narrowed down to two sites. Again, following guidance on keeping all of our staff as well as our families safe through these ever changing times. Um, at the high school middle school, we distributed another six, I mean at the Haverford Middle School, excuse me, we distributed another 62 devices and at Manoa 47 were um, handed out that day. Again, great work by all, but we were hearing and getting emails that there were still some families that needed devices. Um, so beginning on March 26, we started a no contact porch drop off, secured porch drop off for students, but also for staff members who were returning from leave um, and needed a device to engage in their um, instruction and in connection with their students. In total, we, we had 81 deliveries so far and are ranging about 10 to 15 each day. So again, I continue to encourage you um, to reach out to us, reach out to your teacher um, and utilize the help desk phone number or email, which I'll review at the end of this, um, if you still are in need of a device. We're also researching, we also researched and have purchased 50 hotspots that will be given to families without internet access. Um, there, will there will be a delivery once we receive them. We have not received them yet. Obviously the demand is high, but we have purchased them and secured them and we are waiting for them to arrive. Once we do receive them, we'll utilize the same secured port drop off method. Um, so somebody will be in touch with you um, set for those families. With all of those devices and new learning platform, there needed to be some professional development. The technology team created 27 videos um, and are currently um, working on more than that are currently in the process of being developed. Some of the training topics that were already created were Google Meet, Google Calendar, Google Chat or Hangout, Google Classroom for three audiences, for parents, for students, and for staff, Google Forms, Q&A in the Google Slides platform, PowerSchool, QuickTime Movies, Final Site, which is our teacher website, conference calling on iPhone, 
um, and also Zoom conference calling in conjunction with our pupil services related services providers. Other informational guidance that has been created and distributed, um, calling from an outside of the district by utilizing district phone lines. This was a, a tool that staff are capable of doing to not have to show their personal phone numbers, but also make those connections and phone calls to families um, utilizing our school district lines. Also checking voicemail from home. So things that we are capable of, but making sure that our faculty know how to do those and use those, those, um, those tools. Speaking about some of the, um, just to give you a little indication of some of the rapid expansions of these platforms, our Google Classroom, on March 10th, we had 241 active classes. Um, on March 29th, a mere week and a half later, we have 805 active Google Classrooms across the district. Canvas is an educational platform that was already being work, um, utilized in some departments across a varied, um, with varied staff members at the high school. And we have 536 active students engaging on the Canvas platform. Between March 9th and March 15th, there were 176 participants and uh, participations in the Canvas software with 5,216 pages that were being viewed of content or instructional activity. Um, between March 23rd and March 29th, there was 594 participations with the page views increasing to 7,645. Um, Google Meet is a, a similar platform to Zoom where you can have conference calls. Um, between, we've been utilizing that between staff members and administration to conduct meetings, professional development, both um, Jen and Nicole were talking about having department meetings and being able to connect with their staff. Um, this is the means that they're doing that. And we have had over 1,300 Google meetings um, with over 8,100 participants um, since this landscape has changed. So again, with this rapid change in educational landscape, there's also a need to make sure that we are able to support um, and we provide support and that it's available for all of our stakeholders, parents, staff, administrators, students. So how can we do this? Well, from the very beginning, we recognized that there was going to be some larger issues that occurred, which in the past had happened on a regular basis across the district. And we've been able to have on-site technology assistance in the classroom or in an office. We weren't gonna be able to do that. So we researched some options and we secured a software program to provide remote out of network support by technology administrators only for those large scale issues that would need direct assistance. And so far that software has come in such, <laughs> it's come in handy. Um, we've already had 39 remote support sessions to make sure that staff and families are able to get their devices or their software up and running um, where that wouldn't have been able to be done without that software. We also have 15 technology department members who are working staggered shifts to provide timely responses to tickets and to phone calls from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Um, just to review, like I promised I would, emails can be sent to ithelpdesk at haverfordsd.net um, and a ticket will be issued and somebody from the department will be back in touch to remedy that situation. But also we have a phone line in case there's an issue with your email or with your device and you can't access your email to, to call in. We wanted to make sure that there was a call in option available. So that phone number for technology support is 610-853-5951. 853-5951. Leave a voicemail and somebody will return your call. So since March 13th, um, we've had 199 tickets that were resolved, um, but teachers also, that's not inclusive of teachers because teachers have a relationship with their tech assistant in their building. So they're emailing their tech assistants directly. Getting a little finger on the pulse, um, Lori Van Trieste at the middle school estimates that she gets about 30 to 40 emails a day with questions and or um, help requests for some sort of a technology help from her staff. So there's a lot, of, a lot of questions being asked and we're responding um, pretty quickly. We've had 179 family emails answered that came through the IT help desk. 
um, and 37 families have used the voicemail messaging system um, and were able to get technology assistance. We also have another person in the technology department, our systems information system and data administrator, Dr. Gary Moyer. He's been busy meeting the needs of this new educational landscape as well. He's participating in PDE webinars regarding our PIM submission changes and how these changes are gonna affect our state reporting, um, potential attendance procedures and seeking guidance for um, districts in, you know, to answer some of those questions. Dr. Moyer has also been working with various departments to ensure stakeholders have the information they need at their fingertips when things come up. A few of those examples would be updating teachers' um, staff accounts and passwords right in PowerSchool, our student information system, so they can access it and be able to empower themselves with that information by util utilizing PowerSchool. Updating PowerSchool with student login and password information. Again, student has a question, parent has a question, the teacher can answer those questions for them. Providing data regarding our ELL status and home languages for notification and translation services to ensure that all of our families are getting effective communication. And I just want to piggyback on what Jen and Nicole have said. The collaboration between and amongst the departments has been tremendous. Looking and troubleshooting ever-changing challenges, meeting the needs and coming up with solutions um, really has been a positive that has come out of, of this new ever-changing landscape. He's also reporting our free and um, reduced lunch information as that is changing, and also our Chromebook deliveries, um, putting that information right into PowerSchool. We rely on these devices when we are in school, and when we do go back to school, we will need them. Um, so it was imperative that we had the capabilities to record those devices, which devices from which buildings were going to what families, and in that short period of a time, we were able to do that with a collaborative approach. So I would like to thank him for that. Um, hopefully this provided you with a small glimpse into what has been occurring behind the curtain, as we like to say, in order to really keep things smooth, as smooth as possible on the front line of the system. It's a comprehensive list, yes, but it is not an exhausted one. Um, there are many other events and actions that I did not and was not able to capture. But as you can see, the members of the technology department are definitely hard at work. Um, I'm honored to be a part of such a committed and driven team, but I want to take a moment to thank Rob Anderson specifically for his leadership, collaboration, and willingness to go above and beyond every day to ensure that the district is making the best decisions as we navigate these challenging times. And our ultimate goal of this department is to provide access and training to all stakeholders, all, all while maintaining a safe and secure network for all of our information systems. So thank you for allowing me to share that with you. Um, I'll send it back to Dr. Brushi now so we can continue with her remarks. Great, thank you. Thank you, Sarah, Nicole, and Jen, um, and Mr. Feinberg and the board. Thank you for giving us this additional time tonight. I felt it was critical for the members of the community as well as our board to get a sense of the work that has gone on in terms of the, the planning uh, for all the learning that is, is taking place. Um, and that planning will continue. Um, as Jen mentioned, and, and I believe Sarah may have mentioned as well, we are hearing um, what, hearing from parents, uh, hearing from our older students. Uh, we know that people want to be able to have that live contact um, with teachers, and we are looking at how that can best happen, uh, understanding all the resources that are available or may not be available. Uh, but that will be coming forward in our, you know, as we move beyond the spring break and, and what's going to be offered for, stu for students. We're hearing about flexibility in submission of assignments. Um, we know that, you know, parents need us to be aware of what the potential environment is like in the household, and that's not the environment that's in the classroom. And, and we recognize and understand it. We hear that from people and the feedback that we are, we are receiving, and we'll certainly look to address that. And in closing, I want to thank the board for the support uh, that the board has continued to give to the administrative team. Um, when I mentioned email messages, that included email messages from board members as well, you know, who would comment on their appreciation for all that everyone is doing. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rushi. Uh, <clears throat> Jen, Nicole, Sarah, um, 
thanks very much for your presentation and uh, for all of your efforts uh, over these past few weeks. Um, uh, at this point, do any uh, members of the board have any questions or comments on this part of uh, the uh, agenda? Okay, hearing none. The next item on our agenda is a construction project update uh, from uh, Mr. Ken Matthews. Ken? Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Well, thank you for having us. Uh, you've all obviously been very busy um, and we've been continuing to work on, on the capital projects uh, on behalf of the district. So I'll be brief in my updates. I'll start with the high school. Then I'll move on to Linwood. I'll pause after each one so you can ask any questions and we'll go from there. So that being said, uh, the high school, as you know, is uh, under design. In the past week, KCBA has issued the 50% design development documents for review. So they're currently being reviewed by ourselves and the district administrators. Uh, it came along with a cost estimate, which we're also kind of tearing apart and reviewing. So in the coming weeks, we'll uh, go through that, fine tune it and uh, move, move on uh, with some final decisions on the project budget, any other decisions that need to be made so they can uh, continue into the construction documents that are due uh, at the end of August, mid-August, uh, so we can bid the project this fall. So all of that remains on schedule at this time. They also uh, resubmitted their plans to the planning board of the township last week. Uh, after we had a meeting last month, there was a number of comments, so we had to reissue them. They were sent in. We were planning on having a meeting uh, April 9th next week, which uh, unfortunately will be canceled. However, the, uh, the township, similar to the district, is looking at a possible digital solution to having a meeting. So we're hopeful that later in April or in May, we can have the one or two more meetings to finalize the land development process with the township. At the same time this week, we will also be submitting the MPDES permit uh, to DEP. That's an application process for all the erosion and sedimentation controls for the site work. That permit usually takes anywhere from five to seven months. So we do need to get that in. And as I mentioned, that will be going in this week. Uh, lastly, for the high school, there was a, a request for proposal that we issued for an evaluation of the facade of the high school, as there are portions of it that are in not great condition. And we wanted, uh, after working with the district, to include that scope of work uh, for any immediate repairs that are needed as part of the bid documents that go out this August. So uh, we received two proposals from Intertech and from ONS. And we've recommended that the district approve ONS to do a review of the facade and come up with recommendations for repairs and provide construction documents that will be included in KCDA's documents that go out to bid this fall. Uh, their proposal was for $21,520. And they will, uh, we're working with the district solicitor um, and most likely their contract will be assigned to KCBA to their work under them. Uh, so that's it as far as the high school update. If anybody has any questions, I'll pause. Okay, great. So moving on to Linwood, um, we'll start with a progress update and then we have some change orders. So as you all know, Linwood, um, the governor issued a stop work order on Thursday, March 19th. On Friday, March 20th, the workers came to the site to essentially clean up, secure, get on the roof, make sure you know nothing could blow away, screw everything down, take all their tools, equipment, any loose materials, and basically prepare for what uh, you know at that time was an unknown. Uh, for how long the site would be have to be secure. Um, certainly there's concern over theft and vandalism. Uh, both Randon and myself continue to check on the site uh, every few days. 
Um, so we're hopeful that we can continue to do that and uh, hopefully nothing happens there. Then as you know, so and um, just from a progress standpoint, things were moving very well. Uh, a lot of work is in place. The classroom wing is uh, basically the inside of it was just about ready to start drywall. So a lot of rough in of the mechanical and electrical items are, were completed. So um, for right now, of course, it's all on a pause. That being said, this week, the Department of Education issued a clarification to the governor's stop work order that public school work may continue under certain conditions. So we are currently reviewing uh, that with all the, the three prime contractors on the site. And we hope to have an update very soon for everyone uh, whether, where that stands and if construction can or will continue at this time. Uh, so that's uh, any questions as far as progress for Linwood and Okay, that being said we have a handful of change orders First one is Westcott Electric uh, After coordination but through I'm, I'm sorry, Ken. This is Bridget Wiedemann. A couple of us had our hands raised I don't know Larry if you want to go through and oh, I'm sorry um, Take your call on people Let's do them uh, uh, in the order that, that they were received. Antoinette, you're, you're up first. Sure, and sorry, this is um, going backwards because I forgot about the raise hand function. Um, so I had a question about the design recommendation of the high school brick facade. Um, I guess I'm, I'm just a little, I just need a little bit more information on, on what that involves. Um, because I know that this would be for work, I think that you said starts in the fall, is that right? Uh, no, it would just go out to bid this fall. It would go out to bid this fall. So, so the design work itself, if we approve this tonight, would not happen now, that would happen later? Uh, so the idea in releasing them now is to get them started. They have to, uh, so the scope of work is essentially, they come out, they survey the existing facade, the entire facade of the high school, uh, they basically take pictures, catalog, all the conditions, and then they're going to put it into three buckets, basically, kind of immediate need for repair in the few year to five year range, and basically in the 10 plus year range for what needs to be done to care and maintain for the facade. So the goal after that report is certainly it's, it's a working document for the district for their maintenance programs in the coming years but the immediate repairs would be documented in more detail. Um, they'll do some destructive testing to understand what's going on in certain areas, you know, where there's rusted lintels, some brick is cracking, those type of things. And then those documents will be added to the high school additions and renovations bid documents. It will be bid as part of the scope of work. And then that work would start in January, 2021, along with you know, the, uh, the addition, the new additions. Okay, and just logistically, are they able to start on this with the current um, orders from the governor? Could, could I mean, I guess, um, could someone come out and just be one person and take these pictures, that sort of thing? Yes, uh, it, you know, as long as uh, we can work with the district just to gain access, uh, it's really just one person surveying, so They'll be able to maintain social distancing and all those CDC type requirements. They have been surveying other projects, so that work can continue, yes. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Next, uh, next up is Sal. Hi, Ken. Um, Hello. Being here. Um, my question is, if, if we were in a situation as before where everything gets locked down and no one can be on site again, um, and even now, I mean, things just change so dynamically. We're in a change of season now. There's, you know, I remember back when the project started at Linwood, there were some things that need to be adjusted, um, you know, because of potential runoff or things like that that have to be changed. Are we in a situation where those things also would not be able to like if we need anything changed on site because of, uh, you know, something blew away, like you said, or, or something like that, does that mean no one can go to the site at that point? Or are there contingencies in place where things can be adjusted with minimal staff on site? 
Well, right now, um, sir, well, a few things, Sal. So the site, we're in a very good spot as far as the building. Um, we're not worried about um, things getting wet. Uh, you know, we have concrete and steel, the roof's on. We spent time buttoning up the edges. So we're in very good shape as far as any water infiltration, um, all the site erosion and sediment control measures. We walk the site. They're all maintained. There's no issue with them. So as far as is that standpoint, there's really no concern uh, if the building is affected as far as damage, ex those type of things, or excessive runoff. Um, but as far as if it, that's part of the reason why uh, Randy and I are going to check, things were really, uh, you know, they battened down the hatches, so to speak. Um, so we are checking on things. Um, if, you know, there was a situation, we certainly could call the contractor. Um, let's just say if something were to blow off the roof, um, we could certainly get someone there. It's an emergency situation, yes. But, you know, all indications, knock on wood, is that everything's buttoned down very well. And we are hopeful that's not, not a problem. All right, thank you. Yeah, the only reason I ask is because, you know, as you know, the site is within our community. We have community members living around it, you know, and, and in these un, unsure circumstances, I just wanted everyone to make sure that, you know, that, or that everyone to feel comfortable with the site um, in its current condition. So thanks for answering that. I appreciate it. Certainly. The, the number one concern, to be frank, is going to be vandalism and theft. Uh, so that's what we want to keep an eye on. All right, thank you. Next up is Bridget. Thank you. Um, I had two things I wanted to one to ask, one to point out. And um, on our schedule, even if there is a lengthy delay in construction, the building itself was to be largely complete months before the anticipated start of the school year in 2022, correct? So we have some cushion um, in the schedule to remobilize the site and and keep it so even if it were even if there were a delay um, we wouldn't necessarily be pushing um, the building at this point up against the start of the school year is that correct so currently contractually the building is supposed to be 100 percent complete and turned over to the district as of february 1st 2021 so yes there is there is certainly some um, flexibility there you know, we have to be cognizant of it um, because we don't know the effects of this, even though the building doesn't, uh, you know, there is some time if it were to open or excuse me, finish a little later. Um, but the, the biggest thing we need to be uh, leery of is uh, I think the production and manufacturing aspect of things that are going to come to the site. We heard uh, everybody's mm -hmm. heard of the company Armstrong Industries. We heard today that they're all their flooring. Uh, manufacturing is shut down completely. So those are the type of things we just need to monitor. But yes, there is some flexibility, but we'll very closely watch how, how this gets extended and, and see where it goes uh, once we can get back to work. Okay, thank you. And then the other is, um, you said you were assessing the situation, um, even though there have been some regulations that have kind of exempted school projects from the work shutdowns we see in other industries and places. Um, I was curious what kind of assessment um, is being done to determine if the Linwood project um, kind of is in a position to move forward and could do so safely. Well, the so the Department of Education, it was basically, you know, work um, it, it, with the district working along with the contractors, if they can comply with a number of things, which include all the CDC requirements, the social distancing. So we've requested from the contractors what work they feel they can complete or not. Uh, we've asked them to get back to us based on uh, the current conditions uh, with COVID-19. And so we've asked them to get back to us uh, next week, and then we'll be able to evaluate whether they respond back that they will come back to work at all or in some for portion of the work or not so we're we're working through that with them now in um, some of the work that i do professionally um, involves construction projects and i've seen work plans that include as you mentioned the social distancing and 
um, scheduling arrival times and break times and things like that. So there's not um, gatherings of, of people at kind of entrance points or break areas, um, but also um, a protocol for cleaning and disinfecting and sharing of tools and things like that. So I would hope those kinds of um, protocols are outlined in our contractors' responses so that we um, you know, see the whole um, set of um, safety measures that they would be undertaking. Uh, that, that's, that's correct. There's a number of things that, we've, that we expect to be included in their plan so we can understand that, um, let alone you, know, you have workers from all, kind, all different companies. Uh, so that's all part of the review. And so it can be determined whether it's safe to go to back to work or not. Thank you. Next up is Kristen. So my question was similar to Bridget's, um, thinking about this construction waiver. Um, and I know it's a local decision between districts and construction companies to make this determination. Um, I am concerned though, because we have the second highest rate of infection in Delaware County, um, currently with COVID-19 cases. And I'm not really sure how we would even ensure that um, construction workers would be safe, um, being that you know what we're learning about um, the virus kind of evolves every single day. Um, and I'm also wondering what our liability would be if we do bring construction workers back to work and um, you know there's another outbreak at the site, there's community spread at the site. Um, is that being taken sure. into consideration? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, certainly. Of course, there's, there's a lot of things. Obviously, this is unprecedented. Uh, so there's a number of questions. We're working with the district solicitor, uh, of course, uh, to go through that. And th those, there's a lot of questions being asked. That's why we, you know, we asked for this plan. Um, that it wasn't just, you know, I've heard of other folks that just have been asking for waivers and trying to get back to work immediately. And certainly working with the district and their solicitor, that is not the case here. Want to fully understand the picture and the uh, the implications uh, for everything for all the reasons you just stated. Right. And also just to add, um, you know, I know some people are out of the job or will be out of the job soon um, due to the pandemic. Um, but I also don't want our construction workers to be put in a position where if we decide that the project needs to go forward, that they have to choose between their health and their job. Um, so I mean, there's a catch 22 there as well. Certainly. Well, I, I know. That we go talk ahead, Maureen. Today, Ken, as recent as today, there were you know, discussions about that. Um, and that's a, a message that Ken has relayed on, you know, on behalf of, of the district. That's not what we're, you know, what we're looking to do. Um, we, That's correct. We are looking to do a, a partnership if the contractors are willing to come back uh, to be very thorough in that. We're not looking to say, let's do, let's figure out how to get the project moving. We're looking at if the project moves, correct. how overly cautious can we be? Okay, thanks. Yes, that's correct. Any other questions for Ken? Well, Ken, thank you very much. Stay safe. I just have to run through a few change orders quickly, please, okay. Larry. Um, so we have a Westcott electric change order after coordination through the submittal process. Uh, usually items like this flush out. They did have to change some breakers uh, and whatnot. So that's what this change order for $2,867 is for. Second change order for JBM is for $7,650 for some additional rooftop curb blocking. This was essentially a scope gap, uh, as we would say, in the specifications between, it was basically a hole in the specs uh, that was missed between the general contractor and the mechanical contractor, missed meaning in KCBA's documents. Uh, so this work had to be completed, and uh, so it had to be paid for. This third one is uh, JBM Mechanical. There was an additional roof drain that was missed on a small canopy outside of stair three. So that had to be added for $1,739. Following changes for Stubner, it's a credit of $480. There was a small concrete curb up on above the library. It was about a 10 or 20 linear feet that was unnecessary. So we were able to delete that. Following changes for Stubner, it's a credit of $4,298. Uh, there was a, a scoreboard that was included that shouldn't have been in the specs. So that is not required. 
Lastly, there's a credit for four hundred. or excuse me, this is an ad for $408. There's a gym pad that had to be added to the gym to cover the concrete foundation. Uh, that was not originally included in the documents. There's a corner there, so certainly don't want kids running into that. And that's what this is for. Lastly, uh, David Blackmore Associates is the testing and inspection agency for the project. Uh, they've, it's always an estimated contract amount. It's impossible to know the exact amount. So their contract amount is essentially depleted at this point for all the concrete, earth geotech, all of those inspections. Um, so we are asking the board to approve another $20,000 to continue with those inspections. And we estimate that hopefully through the end of the project. Uh, it's really a guesstimate uh, as best as we can, but uh, so we're asking for that this evening. And as a point of clarification for the board, the item that Ken just mentioned is uh, item H in section five of the agenda. No, thank you. Any other questions for Ken? All right, thank you very much. Thank you and good luck and please stay safe and healthy. You too. Take care. Next item on our agenda is a budget update, Mr. Regal. We have a presentation, of a, a, a budget up, update presentation for 2020-21. I'd like to give you an update of where we're gonna be for the 2019-20, uh, so that you have a little bit of assurance that uh, things will come out all right for this fiscal year. Uh, I did a, a projection in February and we had a $1.4 million surplus. Of course in March, uh, the Fed dropped their interest rates 120 basis points and all the interest rates dropped, you know, dropped like a rock. So between that and the transfer tax, real estate taxes, which are pretty much coming to a, a halt also, um, it ate into some of our revenues on that side. Um, we have new expenditures uh, in support of technology curriculum and uh, special ed but we also have some reduction in areas. Utilities are down because we've closed a lot of the buildings up to uh, utility costs. Uh, and there's other areas all around the budget that will make up for some of those new expenditures that we're gonna have to make uh, in these next this month and next. So um, I would predict that we'll still have a surplus. It might be, uh, it might be half of what that we had that before, but 2019-20 is not gonna be in a negative uh, outlook. So if we move to the 2020-21 budget, uh, if we go to the next slide, Act 1 index, as I did on prior uh, presentations, is 2.6%. Act 1 with special ed exception, I had had it down at 3.25%, but uh, it came back approved by uh, the state at 3.22%. It's uh, probably a difference of about $20,000. Uh, medical and prescription increase that's in this budget right now is 1%. Uh, the second look was actually a negative 0.5%, but we have a little bit of cushion in there. Uh, PSERS employer rate is 34.51%. And we have a one-time expenditure still in the budget for textbooks of $662,000. If you go to the next slide, the initial preliminary budget had all these positions in the budget uh, and they're still in there. So uh, they're still reflected in the numbers that I'm gonna provide to you. Uh, so if we go to, to the next slide, these are all the expenditures that we have made, all the reductions in expenditures that we've made uh, since that preliminary budget. We've made almost $1.3 million in reductions. Uh, part of it's capitalized interest. We've uh, reduced, refined and reduced numbers and uh, uh, took, had departments take uh, items out of their budget and uh, we're down $1.3 million from the preliminary budget. So. 
if you go to the next slide, this is the budget summary. The revenues prior to a tax increase are 128 million seven hundred and six thousand. The expenditures are down to 133 million three hundred thirty two thousand. That gives us a shortfall of four million six hundred twenty five thousand. We are our, our tax increase is 3.22%, which is our index plus exceptions. And that brings in $3,169,731. That leaves us with a shortfall, which we have to take out of our fund balance. The shortfall in, includes uh, a one-time expenditure, 662000 for those textbooks and $793,872 uh, just to balance the budget. So um, one of the things I want, want to make clear is that these numbers were put together uh, in late February, early March, and they've been updated, but they are missing uh, the same pieces that I talked to about in the projection there needs to be a reduction in the interest earnings and also the transfer tax. Uh, and I, that's why we have finance meeting on uh, April 16th to make some decisions on those because uh, the assumptions that are being used for this budget for those two items uh, probably have to change. Uh, this budget currently, uh, the average taxpayer, their increase is $174. If you go to the next slide, with this increase, uh, the six-year average increase is 2.67%. So we're still in the index range, even though we had uh, probably our first uh, increase in six years that was higher than index. So we're still at 2.67%. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, our calendar that's left, uh, this is the budget update. Uh, April, that it says April 2nd, but that uh, should be April 16th is the finance liaison meeting. And then uh, at five o'clock, I believe, then April 23rd, uh, we adopt the proposed final budget. And then June 4th, we're planning on adopting the final budget. And that's it. Uh, uh, anybody have any questions? Questions from the board? Antoinette? Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, my only question is, you know, we've all seen that taxes have been um, delayed, I think, federally and at the state level. Does that affect our budget in any way? No, we'll, we'll receive, we've been given uh, assurances that we're going to get everything that we were entitled to uh, through our budget, uh, whether it's, you know, I, I know next year will be, from what I gather, is tricky because a lot of money that's in the state budget is coming from sales tax. Obviously, sales tax revenue is not doing very well right now, and uh, that'll affect how things go for next year. Um, but uh, right now, I think they're, they should be okay. From what I gather, that we'll get our payments. Uh, they schedule them every other month. So, so you normally get a piece of your percentage of your basic ed subsidy or transportation subsidy every other month. So uh, I, I don't know, but I believe we will be getting, we got most of it already, you know, so. We've got two thirds of our subsidies already. So um, the big one probably is the half a reimbursement for retirement and half a reimbursement for uh, FI, you know, FICA or Social Security. So we do get half of that back in the form of subsidy and a lot of that will come, come in, uh, in uh, June and, and actually September of the next year, so. Um, Okay, thanks. Okay. We also 
we also have a, a, a cat we also have a fund balance of 11 million dollars with a four million extra for, committed for capital and i think this is why you do have a fund balance because uh when you get short if, if say the state didn't have enough funds our fund balance would come into play to cover the costs so our cash flow would make it through the budget year so Hey, Laura, your, your hands up. Yes, thanks. Um, so I know that on the revenue side, um, the lowering of interest rates is hurting us, um, but is there something that we can take advantage of here in terms of our debt service? Well, one of the good things about 2019-20 is the fact that I, we get all our real estate money in August and the rates were very good in August. So we locked in what we do is we lock in money. We have 26 payrolls and you know, they're two and a half million dollars or whatever. We send out an investment, term investment that covers that payroll. Uh, usually you start at the farthest out and come back if the rates are good. Uh, and we've covered a lot of them. So that'll help us as we get down that line item to make sure you know, we don't have a huge shortfall in that, that side. Um, but, um, but you know, the, on the on the other side, I have talked to PFM, our financial advisor, and he got back to me. I didn't get a chance to look at what his uh, what he had to say, but he was looking into the fact that uh, these interest rates are down. Is it an opportunity for us to to refinance and and pick up you know a large saving that we could you know fill that hole that we have right now with? And that's a that's a very possibility, but we do have what they call a, an advanced refunding out there, and that means the call date is probably two years down the road. But if it's such a good deal, you might do the refunding now, put the money in escrow, and then two years from now, they'll call it and pay it. But the interest rates were so so uh, different, you know, so good that. Uh, we still had huge savings on it. So maybe with this, these interest rates way down, we could get, take advantage of that. It really depends on how the bonds are structured. If, mm -hmm. if, if the rates that are long-term rates out in 20 years from now or 15 years from now are still high, uh, that it might not, not be able to be done. But if, if we have a lot of it that's in the short, shorter term with these, really low interest rates, you might be able to take advantage of it. So. Great. Um, and, and my other question was about um, whether or not PD has said anything. I know um, we've had additional expenditures on technology and things like that so that everybody can have access in their homes. Um, I know that other districts, I'm sure, have spent a lot more than we have. Um, has PDE said anything about um, any exceptions or anything like that going forward just so that districts can recover some of these costs in some way now, and we know we know that there will be some funding uh, however that is yet to be identified is it going to be allocated as title one funds are allocated uh, what will it be you know what will it be used for um, so we're waiting to get more information on that okay. we're, we're tracking all our expenditures in that area so that when that day comes we have all our detail available to you know to take advantage of that, so. Great, all righty, thank you so much. Any other questions for Mr. Regal? I just have a, a couple of comments there. The, uh, at the state level, in terms of the revenue for the current year, uh, the March figures were just in, and you know, with these few weeks of uh, the COVID-19 uh, circumstances, you know, revenue certainly was down uh, in terms of uh, the June revenue estimate, um, I'm hearing that they think that the state might take a half a billion dollar hit um, in revenue. Um, and in part, um, that's, that's where the federal money uh, hopefully will come in and be of some assistance. Uh, Congress did pass uh, the CARE Act that has $523 million earmarked for K-12 in Pennsylvania. 
but as Dr. Rushi said, right now we don't know uh, exactly how that's going to be distributed. Um, uh, you know, that, that remains to be seen. Um, one of the items that we've uh, heard discussed over several years is uh, uh, tax reform. And most of the plans that have been put forth uh, had some combination of a, tr uh, a switch from the property tax to uh, using both the sales tax and uh, uh, income tax. And it, um, in the situation that we're in right now, um, we're pretty lucky that that did not come to pass. Um, you know, the, we don't, ex you know, with the number of people that are losing their jobs uh, and uh, the business is closed, uh, both of those sources of revenue are going to be in pretty tough shape uh, looking at next year's budget. So we'll be following the, the federal dollars and, you know, as we get more information uh, and we'll pass that along to the board. Bob, do you have anything else at this point? No, that's it. Right, well, thank you very much. The next item on the agenda uh, for information purposes only, secretary to submit for insertion into the minutes, the financial report as of February 29th, 2020. Moving right along, I'll accept the motion to approve budget transfers in the amount of $32,975. Dr. Crispin, you're up. Who's moving? I move. Crispin moves. Ari Fleischer seconds. Second. Moved and second. Roll call vote anyway on this one. Crispin, Dr. yes. Dr. Crispin? Yes. Mr. Fleischer? Yes. Ms. Larson? Yes. Ms. Minji? Yes. Mr. Sinta? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes. Nine voting yes. Thank you, everybody. Next item is the bill list. I'll accept the motion to approve disbursements from the following funds as listed. Fleischer, move. Larson, seconded. And shall we just go through the roll call again? You want me to do that? Yeah, it's easier that way. Okay. Dr. Crispin? Yes. Mr. Fleischer? Yes. Ms. Larson? Yes. Ms. Minji? Yes. Mr. Sinto? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes, nine voting yes, thank you. Next item on the agenda, change orders. I'll accept the motion to accept, accept the recommendation of the new Linwood Elementary School project architect, KCBA and Associates, Inc and Owner's Representative, CB Development Services, Inc., and authorized change orders as listed. And these were the change orders that uh, Mr. Matthews uh, went through with us. Fleischer Schwartz moved. moved. Fleischer second. Moved and second. Mr. Eagle, could you call the roll again? Yes. Uh, doc Dr. Crispin? Yes. Mr. Fleischer? Yes, and thank you to CB Development and Ken Matthews for taking such good care of us. Ms. Larson? Yes. Ms. Minji? Yes. Mr. Sinta? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes, nine voting yes, thank you. Next item, I'll accept a motion to approve the agreement with Crown Castle for moving the fiber optic lines from the old building to the new Linwood Elementary at an estimated cost of $19,842.49 plus applicable taxes and fees. Place your move. Chris, a second. <laughs> Moved and second. Mr. Regal, can we get a roll call? Dr. Crispin? Yes. Mr. Fleischer? 
Yes, move it. Ms. Larson? Yes. Ms. Minji? Yes. Ms. Mr. Sinto? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes, nine voting yes, thank you. Next, I'll accept a motion to approve the pan, uh, Plan Con K documents from PDE associated with general obligation bonds series 2019B and authorize proper officers of the board to execute these documents. Fleischer moves. Report second. Seconds. Okay. Let's call the roll. Dr. Crispin. Dr. Crispin. Yes. Mr. Fleischer. Yes. Ms. Larson. Yes. Ms. Minji. Yes. Mr. Sinto. Yes. Mr. Schwartz. Yes. Ms. Snodgrass. Yes. Ms. Wiedemann. Yes. Mr. Feinberg. Yes. Nine voting yes. Thank you. I'll accept a motion to approve a recommendation from the owner's representative CB development to engage O and S associates to provide design services for the brick facade at the high school at a cost not to exceed $21,520. We moved. Larson second. second. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Dr. Griffin? Yes. Mr. Fleischer? Quick question. Um, that is for assessment and the work? No, it's the assessment. Only the assessment. Um, just the assessment and construction documentation. So they're going to come up with a plan for us after the assessment. Sorry, this is what I had asked questions about that um, Ken had gone over. And so this is about the design that's going to be, what Ken had explained to my question was, this was about the design that's going to be included then in the RFP that goes out later. So this is going to be an incorporation into um, what goes into the RFP. For the for the work itself um, later this year. Thank you, Antoinette. Sorry, I missed that. Yes. Okay, uh, Ms. Larson. Yes. Uh, Ms. Minji. Yes. Mr. Sinto. Yes. Mr. Schwartz. Yes. Ms. Snodgrass. Yes. Ms. Wiedemann. Yes. Mr. Feinberg. Yes. Nine voting yes. Thank you. I'll accept the motion to approve the recommendation from owner's representative CB development for a budget extension for David Blackmore and Associates Inc. for the remainder of the project inspection and testing services. The recommendation is for an extension of $20,000. Larson move. Larson second. Mr. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Dr. Crispin? Yes. Mr. Fleischer? Yes. Ms. Larson? Yes. Ms. Minji? Yes. Mr. Sinto? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes. Nine voting yes. Thank you. I'll accept the motion to approve the 2020 2021 special education intergovernmental funding and service agreement with the Delaware County Intermediate Unit in the amount of $934,910. Snodgrass moved. Larson seconds. Moved and second. Any discussion? All in, uh, not a roll call again, sorry. Dr. Crispin? Yes. Fleischer? Yes. Ms. Larson? Yes. Ms. Minji? Yes. Mr. Sinto? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes. Thank you. I'll accept the motion to approve uh, the 20, oh, sorry, hang on. 
to approve the, the DCIU general operating budget and adopt the resolution for the fiscal year 2020-2021 in the amount of $9,616,248, with Haverford share being $109,650.09. Larson moved. For a second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Dr. Crispin? Yes. Mr. Fleischer? Yes. Ms. Larson? Yes. Ms. Minji? Yes. Mr. Sinto? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes. Thank you. I'll accept a motion to approve the budget and adopt resolution number 56 for the Delaware County Vocational Technical Schools for the 2020-2021 fiscal year in the amount of $14,406,225 with Haverford share being $775,884. Minji moved. Fleischer second. second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Dr. Crispin? Yes. Mr. Fleischer? Yes. Ms. Larson? Yes. Ms. Minji? Yes. Mr. Sinto? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes. Thank you. I'll accept the motion to accept the retirements and resignations as listed. Um, Mr. Fox, Go more back more to L, Larry. One more item there. The board member slate of nominations. Sorry about that. We can't leave Susan hanging. Sorry, Susan. I'm, Susan. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> I'll accept the motion to approve the nominations and corresponding resolution for the individuals listed to serve as board members to the Delaware County Intermediate Unit number 25, a three-year term beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2023. Todd Grass moved. Fourth we'll second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Great work, Susan. Susan, you good with that? Three years, sure. Yeah. Yes, I'm good with that. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. We know that's more meetings. <laughs> yes, it is. It's okay. Thank you, Susan. You know all your names are going to be rolling around in my head as I you? sleep tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dr. Crispin. Yes. Mr. Fleischer. Yes. Ms. Larson. Yes. Ms. Minji. Yes. Mr. Sinto. Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. Ms. Snodgrass? Yes. Ms. Wiedemann? Yes. Mr. Feinberg? Yes. Mr. Parker, if I may, could I ask a point of order question? Yes, sir. Instead of us going through all these extended roll call votes, um, is it is it proper procedure for me to just ask if there's anybody who's voting no on a motion? Frankly, Mr. President, having not been in this circumstance previously, I think that's acceptable as long as the record reflects that everyone had a chance to uh, indicate um, uh, a no vote uh, and you you confirm that it's uh, a unanimous consent situation and the record will reflect that. I think that's acceptable. Board members, does anybody have a, any, any concerns with that? Um, as long as we don't have to use the raise hand function, <laughs> I think that's fine. <laughs> I'll keep an eye on the raise hand function nevertheless, but it'll save us a little time and going forward, uh, It'll save us a lot of time in future meetings. So, okay, 6A, I'll accept the motion to accept the retirements and resignations as listed. Sinto moved. Second, Minji. 
Moved and second. Any discussion? Just to say thank you to all those who've given us so many years of service. Yeah, and there are folks here that have been with us for 30, 34, 35 years. So uh, thank you very much. Anybody opposed? Not seeing any votes no, it's unanimously approved. I'll accept the motion to approve the appointments as listed. Larson moved. Kristen second. Moved and second. Any discussion? This is Antoinette Sagras. I just want to say thank you to all these folks that are joining us uh, at this, you know, interesting time. It is an interesting time. Hmm. Anybody opposed? Motion carries. I'll accept the motion to approve the leaves of leave requests as listed. Snodgrass moved. Crispin second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. I'll accept the motion to approve the memoranda of agreements between the district and ESPA and PSPA bargaining units for the period March 16th to 29th, 2020, regarding the state ordered school closure. Lindsay, move. Fourth second. I'm moving. M moved and second. Any yeah. discussion? Any discussion? This is Antoinette Sagras. Um, if we could just get some. Um, explanation for the public on what these are and why we are um, moving on them. I think that would be great. So these were the two memoranda of agreement uh, that were negotiated by the district solicitor with two bargaining units, ESPA, our uh, professional support staff, and our uh, PSPA, maintenance transportation group. They cover only the period from the initial uh, closure, March 16th through March 29th. At that point in time when these were negotiated, it wasn't clear how the state was going to act with respect to school employees. Since that time, of course, the state has passed Act 13. And so to some extent, uh, the passage of that legislation may have ob obviated the need for these memoranda, but uh, because they were uh, restricted to that two week period and they provided some details in the administration of pay uh, that could be useful uh, for that two-week period, uh, we are asking you to approve them. But bear in mind that uh, the, the period of time that they apply to has now concluded, uh, and now the pay for employees is governed by uh, the newly passed Act 13 Pennsylvania legislation. Any additional questions or comments? So we, we had a move and second on this one. Yeah. Any any yeah. no votes? Any no votes? Okay, motion carries. I'll accept the motion to approve the educational service contract with Valley Forge Educational Services at the Vanguard School for a student within the district. Larson moved. Weedman second. second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Any opposed? Thank you, motion carries. I'll accept the motion to accept the recommendation of special counsel and authorize settlement of pending special education administrative proceedings listed for privately obtained legitimate education expenses and counsel fees. Snodgrass moved. Minji second. Moved and second, any discussion? Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you very much. I'll accept a motion to approve the calendar for the 2021-2022 school year. First moved. Minji second. Moved and second. And we can look back uh, to how important this calendar was just a short time ago. 
Yeah, not that long. Not that long ago, it was the <laughs> focal point of of our attention. Uh, any any questions or comments from the board at this point? Do we still want to approve the calendar now, given um, that everything's in flux and up in the air, particularly with construction at Linwood? Uh, actually, the ca the calendar as it is there has the start. This is the one with the start after Labor Day. Um, so I might be a little apprehensive if, if it had us going earlier than that, which one of our prior versions did. Um, but this is the one with the September 9th start of school. And Ms. Larson, we can always, as, as a matter of fact, we will be bringing the current calendar at some point in time for revision. So mm -hmm. if, if something occurred, but I think for you know planning purposes was really why we wanted to get the communication out um, regarding when school would be starting. Right. Okay. Are there any other highlights, Dr. Rushi? I know this was a, a big topic before the coronavirus pandemic. So maybe you could take us through it a little bit um, so that everyone on here and the rest of the community paying attention um, has a nice picture of it from your standpoint. Sure, happy to. And I also want to note that, you know, it will be on or is on and will be uh, on, the on the district website. Uh, but that ha it has our first day of school as September 9th, uh, which you know follows the Labor Day uh, holiday uh, and the observance of Rosh Hashanah. Uh, then we have the standard um, break at Thanksgiving. Uh, we still maintain the winter break is intact. Uh, when we move the one difference for this particular year, spring break, we typically have closed for students on what is referred to as Easter Monday, and that has been an in-service day for staff. In April of 2022, uh, that will be a school day for both students uh, and, and our staff. Uh, and this calendar has our last day of school for students as a fr Friday, um, June 17th, which has we have heard over and over is helpful to parents when they're looking at what types of programs they want to enroll students in or activities that students wish to become involved can become challenging when our school year extends into a you know as far as a Wednesday or so and, and splits the week up. Any other questions or comments regarding the calendar? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rushi. I also just wanted to say I know this is um you know, not front and center anymore because of what's going on, but I just want to reiterate my thanks to Dr. Rushi and her staff for spending so much time on the calendar and, um, you know, really putting in the effort with community feedback and um, making sure that everything works for our students and our staff and with construction. Um, I also just want to say, you know, I think that recent events have um, hopefully enlightened some folks about why we build in days, um, you know, in the calendar, um, you know, e extra days. So. Uh, you know, I hope, I hope that people, um, you know, can appreciate that. And again, just thank you to Dr. Rushi and her staff. You are welcome and uh, thank you for your remarks. Any other questions or comments? Any, any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. That takes us to the wonderful world of board reports. There's one more item, Mr. Fine, the, the approval of board policy number 220. Okay, I, I sit corrected. I'll accept the motion to approve policy number 220, student expression, distribution, and posting of materials. Badgrass moved. Second. Moved and second. Any discussion? Uh, anyone voting no on this one? Seeing none, motion carries. Thank you very much. Now we can plunge full speed ahead into board reports. Uh, Mr. Fleischer, would, would you like to start us off? I have no report. Ms. Crispin? Well, this is a weird time. Um, where am I? my professional life collides with my life as a school board member. Um, I am trying to teach all of my college classes online while also parenting a small child. So just 
recognizing the challenges that all of our teachers who have children um, or other caregiving uh, are facing right now, all of those challenges, um, it's, it's significant. And all the parents now who are trying to help with their children's learning while they're also trying to work full time, um, it's really challenging. Um, and after hearing the reports from Dr. Rushi and all of her staff, um, thank you to all of them. Thank you to all of our teachers, the parents, everybody who's really pulling together to just do the best we can in this really unprecedented time. Um, stay inside, wash your hands, and hopefully this will be over quickly. So thank you. Thanks. Antoinette? Sure, out of order. Um, or I guess that it would be in the regular order. Um, yeah, I just want to reiterate um, Dr. Crispin's remarks that, um, you know, thank you to Dr. Rushi and her staff um, and all of the teachers. Um, you know, I also have a student in the district. Um, you know, it's difficult for us. It's difficult for you. Um, I really like Jen Sachs's um, uh, categorization as, as crisis learning um, because, you know, it's really special um, and hopefully not something that we ever have to go through again. Um, but I just want to say, um, you know, if, if everyone on all sides can just focus on patience, um, patience with everyone, patience with the people that you're working with, um, the people that, you know, are your educators or your students, um, and with the parents, if we can all just exercise a little bit of extra patience throughout this whole thing, it will be a lot easier for everyone. I've experienced um, a lot of patience on all sides, and I appreciate that, and, um, you know, I hope that everyone else is too, so let's just, you know, come together as a community and be patient and stay inside. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Points well taken. Susan? Thanks, Larry. Uh, I just want everyone to know and be aware that the Delaware County Intermediate Unit is working as hard as you heard the Haverford School District working. Um, I have been to some Zoom meetings there and we've talked nonstop about how to make sure kids are receiving services and everything is going as planned. I know a lot of parents are very worried because this is transition time, but I want them to feel confident that the IU has got it handled. And just as the rest of us are all being creative with how we're doing things, they're doing a great job of it too. Uh, I want to congratulate Dr. Jennifer Saska, Sarah, and Nicole Battistelli. My main concern tonight was what's going on to really know from those who know. And I congratulate all three of those women on really letting us know in great terms exactly how we're doing, what we're doing, and the timeline. I think that's important. I think people know it. And of course, above all in this world, I think we're all learning that leadership is the most important thing we're looking for. And uh, I don't even know what to say except Dr. Rushi, you're the rock star. You're doing a great job, all of you. So thank all of you. That's it. Great team effort, Susan. Thank you very much. Here, here. Mr. Sento. Uh, Antoinette, I'm going to tell my children that not only their mother and father tell them to be patient, but the members of the board also tell them to be patient. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, thank you to everybody, Dr. Rushi, all the administrators, all the teachers. Um, it's been really nice to know that, uh, there's been a plan in place and the execution of that plan has been so solid. So thank you and thank you for being flexible in everything you do. Um, also, just thank you to the, the PSBA too. Um, I know that you know we have really good leadership there uh, in the section advisors and, and in our region here, um, more so than what I've been meeting, but I understand that there's been meetings among PSBA and with the, um, with the, with the advisors and, and their leadership um, has been um, has been there in this crisis too. So thanks to that. Great, Kristen. Just wanted to echo what others have said. Um, these have been incredibly stressful times where we're all worrying about staying healthy or keeping our families healthy, or if we're dealing with sick family members, making sure that they get better, and also making sure that our basic needs are met. Um, things that used to be so simple as grocery shopping are now, you know, potentially life and death matters. Um, so in light of that, I know. This could be, is a very stressful situation for people, but just the active role that dis the district has taken in being proactive and um, shifting the entire, um, you know, mode of operation to an online format is pretty remarkable. So thank you all for your hard work. Great. Dave? 
Thanks. Um, first of all, very enlightening reports today by all the, the administrative uh, uh, um, staff. It's been said before, it'll be said again, but it really can't be said enough. You guys are amazing. Thank you very much for all that you do. I'm convinced that Dr. Rushi has unlocked the secret of human cloning because she has been everywhere these past couple of weeks. So thank you very much for all of your, for all of your dedication. Also big thanks to the faculty. Uh, my daughter is, is, is a fifth grader and um, all of this, all the online um, opportunities that that that, that she's been, been given and the support by the teachers has been has been fantastic. It's we all know it's not easy, but um, we are we all are in it together. So I want to thank everybody for that, and um, also very happy to see the calendar passed. And thank you once again, obviously, for all your hard work on the calendar. That was. Um, I think we ended up with a very, very good product there. And also want to thank everybody who sent in emails to thank us or and to thank Dr. Rushi and her staff for putting together, I think, what turned out to be a very good and hopefully more predictable calendar for um, for the next couple uh, of years. So thanks a lot and that's it for me. Bridget. Hi. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a couple of things. It's nice to see everybody. Um, I've been noting the attendees at one point, I think we had as high as 68 people. We've had some people drop off though, so we went through the business agenda, but I'm glad people tuned in to see the work that we're doing and to get the update from Dr. Rushi and the administrators. Um, it, I was exhausted just listening to you and uh, the comprehensive work that you've been doing behind the scenes and, and send my thanks and appreciation for all of that. Um, I was thinking back on kind of one of my last normal days um, before all of the, the closures started rolling out and Thursday, March 12th, um, I had one of the evening appointments at the middle school um, with the student-led conferences and you could tell we were on the eve of some, you know, news, there was something out there, but um, for me, it's my last student conference uh, with my youngest being an eighth grader. Um, and it was great to get into the school. One, it smelled so clean. It looked clean. It smelled clean. <laughs> that was very reassuring. It was nice to see the community um, still coming out at that time when kind of the fear was beginning. Um, and it was nice to have that connection. And, and who knew that was maybe one of the um, last face-to-face -face, uh, interactions with the school that we'll have for a while, but it was a good experience. And um, having a middle school and high school student, um, I just wanna um, say how great it's been to get the regular con um, communication from the principals and the teachers, the assignments, and um, that's definitely helped us get through what has felt like already a lot of long days. Um, and it's nice to see the approach, um, not just on the educational content and the assignments, but um, the language that's being used that we don't have to be socially distant from each other. Um, let's be socially connected while we're physically apart. Um, and the middle school had their kind of spirit week activities and, and fun things like that, encourage people to communicate and connect and share their school spirit. And um, let's keep that going. Um, and just also wanted to um, hold out some hopes that there are some um, milestones for our graduating class and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of disappointment at this point that the sports season and the play didn't go on as planned and, and some other spring activities, but I'm still hopeful that um, some of those milestones can be um, reimagined in some form as need be as we get closer to the end of the school year. Thank you. The board uh, met in executive session by electronic means on Wednesday, March 25th, 2020 to review personnel matters, including appointments, resignations, leaves of absence, and memoranda of agreement addressing payment of employees during the school closure due to the COVID-9 pandemic. Our next uh, regular public board meeting is scheduled for uh, Thursday, April the 23rd 
uh, at same time, same place, 7.30. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, uh, this evening. You know, I think uh, first time out, uh, everybody did pretty well. Uh, it was great to have uh, 67 attendees. Um, we're, we're down to the hardcore 25 at this point, and I thank all of them for, for taking the time. I'd like to remind you that uh, a recording of this meeting will be up on our website within the next couple of days. Um, I, I certainly want to echo uh, comments from the other board members uh, regarding patience and understanding. It's, as we know, it's one thing to be patient and understanding for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. Uh, I think that we're probably in this for the long haul. Um, and uh, we're, we're gonna need to really uh, pull together uh, and support e each other uh, in this community. Um, uh, so please, uh, you know, stay home, stay safe. If you get out to walk or run, which you should do uh, to blow off some of this stress, please uh, maintain proper social distance. Uh, we'll look forward to uh, seeing everybody in a couple weeks. And I think that takes care of everything. Dr. Rushi, am I missing anything? Yep, that's it. We, you can look for a motion to adjourn. I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Short, I grasp motion. move. Oh. Thank seconds. you, everybody. Be safe. Be healthy. Be safe. Good night. Be well. Good night.